Hi, Emily. Hi, Anne. Well, we should introduce ourselves. I'm Anne Althaus uh, here at the University of Wisconsin Law School and the blog Althaus, and you're? I'm Emily Bazlon. I'm a senior editor at the online magazine Slate. Great. So we have a few topics here today, and we were just talking. It seemed like they uh, kind of congregated around the idea of children and things adults do to children and things other adults uh, object to that adults do to children. So there's a little bit of a children, law, and uh, abusing children sort of a theme. Or, or maybe not abusing, but uh, possibly objectionable things that people do with children. But with that said, obviously the first topic is the Lori Drew case. There was a, uh, a conviction in this uh, case where a woman was prosecuted, actually prosecuted, I think, in Los Angeles, right? Yes. For something that she did in, where Missouri. was it? Missouri? Yes. So she's in the same town with another young woman, uh, and uh, she sets up a MySpace page with a fictional character who then interacts with this 13-year-old girl um, and, and creates sort of a phony love relationship that, when it breaks up, apparently uh, leads the girl to kill herself. Um, which made everyone quite mad at Lori Drew, and there was a, uh, a, a rather strange, I think, prosecution, which was partially successful. The felony was, uh, they, w they didn't convict on the felony ground, but they convicted on a couple of misdemeanors of a, uh, violating a federal statute that I think is a little, uh, a little odd. What did you think of that? Well, I think there's this big question about prosecutorial overreach in this case. So, you yeah. know, the woman prosecuted, Lori Drew, is the mother of another young girl. And this is basically this kind of awful family drama where mm -hmm. there was um, a, the Meyer family and the Drew family, and the girls were friends, and then they weren't friends anymore. And Lori Drew, kind of on behalf of her daughter, got very upset and angry and then created this fake online persona of the 16-year-old boy named Josh who wooed mm -hmm. um, Megan Meyer and then kind of dropped her and said, actually, right. in his, one of his last emails to her, the world would be a better place without you. And then there's this... Actually, thing. the last thing was on a, on a, on an, on a, on a chat, an iChat. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't on MySpace. So it actually, uh, there was an article today uh, from the... That where they'd interviewed the forewoman of the, of the jury, and she said that they couldn't get to a conviction on the felony ground because they didn't have that last piece of evidence. They didn't have the message that said the world would be better off without you. They just had the messages about, I love you. Oh, that's so really interesting. The, the so that helps explain the split verdict. Because we have this split yeah. verdict from the jury where they found Lori Drew, the mom, guilty of these three counts, uh, counts that had to do with um, using her MySpace account in an unauthorized way, like basically that she had created this fake persona, persona and had registered wrong. And they didn't convict her of tortious conduct leading to emotional distress, which is the what right. you know one would sort of imagine as the real cyberbullying crime, if it was a crime in this case. Um, but there is no cyberbullying statute here. No. It's just a statute about... Ill, Ill, unauthorized access to computers. It's an anti-hacking statute. Right, and so I, that's like this, the big question I think we started with is, you know, was this an appropriate use of the statute or does it create all kinds of potential criminal liability for lots of use of the internet? Yeah, I think that, so. And, and does, does it seem to you like that's right? I mean, that's certainly been a lot of the other law professors who've weighed in, on, have weighed in on that side. Does anyone think it is right? I mean, I think we're kind of all on the same side here, that it's terribly wrong to use this anti-hacking statute in a way that was never envisioned by Congress. Uh, and it seems like you have this woman that people just hate. And, and by the way, I just wanted to add that Lori Drew was protecting her own child, that the girl who commits, committed suicide, Megan Meyer, uh, she thought that she had been spreading ugly rumors about Lori Drew's daughter, and so she was trying to get information, and she was, that's what she was convicted of, getting information after unauthorized access uh, to this website. And, uh, you know, she was trying to find out if, that, if Megan really was spreading ugly rumors about her daughter. So she was trying to protect her own child. And she actually didn't send the messages that were the worst. She was just involved with some other people who were doing it. But I have, just have a real problem with saying, here are the terms of service to use MySpace. And if you're in violation of those terms of service, then you're in an unauthorized way accessing the website MySpace. And then it's as if you were hacking into somebody's computer. But we all 
use all kinds of websites that we think we're open to and able to use and authorized to use, but if we happen to be violating the terms of service, suddenly we're unauthorized. And then if we're just trying to get information, we're violating a federal criminal statute? That's just crazy. Right, and, and obviously these um, agreements that we all agree to, they're kind of classic adhesion contracts, to use the legal term of art, in that there are these right. long clauses in small print, nobody really reads them, no one necessarily knows exactly what they're agreeing to. And you have a norm of use on the Internet that's full of pseudonyms, and you know people often register and don't right. want to give their real name. So that seems quite jarring. And that's one of the violations of the terms of service, to impersonate someone else or to use a fake name. Even to give a fake age can be a, a violation of the terms of service. I was looking at uh, the terms of service on Blogger and on Facebook, which I use, and things like hey, uh, Facebook, for example, uh, uh, forbids hateful, racially, or ethnically, or otherwise objectionable uh, comments. So, uh, and, and, you know, you could be having just a political discussion, and someone might want to characterize that as being hateful. Uh, you know, blogger actually refers to um, uh, ha hateful comments with respect to sexual orientation or, or veteran status and things like that. So there are a lot of uh, surprising, really, uh, limitations that on, on exactly what you think people would talk about on, on websites and, and would be encouraged to do. Now, it's a, it's a private service, so you know they can set their own terms. But the idea that the that the government would adopt those terms and that would become an element of a crime, it just uh, presents a terrible free, uh, freedom of speech uh, rights problem. Right, and Oren Kurz, a law professor at GW, did a sort of right. funny but, you know, a wry and also black humor way of presenting right. all of this when he blogs for Vault's Conspiracy and he wrote up terms of, spe of service for his blog saying, if your name is Ralph, if you've ever gone to Alaska, you're no longer yeah. allowed. And, and the point is just to show that the government seems to be accepting these terms of service agreements um, with all the free speech problems and, and just all kinds of, you know, whatever stipulations they want to have in them, and then using that as the basis for a prosecution, that seems yeah. very problematic. Um, so the two things, just to, to take you on about this a little bit um, for the sake uh -huh. of having a little more fun with it. So yeah. one question is to just make the distinction that because one prosecutor did this doesn't mean that it, you know all of a sudden all over the country everyone's going to be prosecuted for every violation right. of, and right and so that if we but that's the problem just, and that's, that's the, problem the very problem it's so selective you it, let's say uh, what strikes me is incredibly abusive it's like loitering laws where you only go after the people who you, you dislike for some other reason. Um, you have these minimal crimes that maybe everyone is committing. And then that means that they, and they're not going to, they're not committed to prosecuting all of these violations. And the ordinary person doesn't fear them, but just, ex it, it's wrong to accept that those crimes are there to be selected and used whenever the prosecution has some other motivation to go after you. It strikes me as incredibly abusive. The statute should be defining crimes that were committed to prosecuting when anyone does them. That's equal justice under the law. The idea that because people hate Lori Drew and they think she's a terrible person, they want to get revenge, therefore the government will select one of these non-crime-like crimes and go after her for them. And they'll be able to prove it because she really did do those things, but they're not committed to holding anyone else responsible for doing those things. I think that's a terrible abuse of power. Right. I mean, you could argue this is kind of the definition of a bad interpretation of the law. If you're going to have such incredibly selective prosecution of it that you're only going to go after people mm -hmm. for whom there's animus. I mean, that said, you know, we always have prosecutorial discretion and prosecutorial selectivity. No, you know, every instance of no crime is actually prosecuted. Um, so, yeah, But they should at least be crimes that we're willing to commit to as really being crimes as opposed to just junk strewn yeah. about the statute books that can be used for, for no, uh, for, for any reason. Right, you know, I it's mean... It's one thing to use... Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, is it possible that one good thing that could come out of this case is Congress going in and rewriting the statute? Because they sort of open themselves up to a certain degree by writing this very vague statute. There's been little judicial interpretation of it previously. Well, I think the, we're a little in danger of the opposite occurring. I saw that there was a Megan Meyer Cyberbullying Prevention Act that was introduced in Congress. It hasn't gone anywhere yet, but it's just... Uh, 
really expanding out to take what Lori Drew did and making that into uh, a crime, uh-huh. actually being the subject. So, I mean, there's one thing is uh, should the statute that uh, they used in this case be limited so that it isn't used this way? But another idea is, well, uh, now what we need is a statute so that we can be out front and really... Uh, say we want to prosecute people who do exactly what she did. Right. I mean, if they wrote a much more narrowly drafted statute, that might be a better outcome. On the other hand, one would want to reserve, you know, let's see what they actually come up with because cyberbullying is exactly the kind of statute that leads to prosecutions of hate speech or just, you know, speech that people don't like. And so that can seem very problematic on First Amendment grounds. I do think um, there is an underlying, um, you know, sort of, a very dismaying aspect of this case. I mean, you brought up and you're right to do it that there was this bad blood between these families that, you know, Lori Drew didn't mm-hmm. just suddenly go after Megan Meyer. There had been these previous, you know, things that, that Megan Meyer had done online that also might be cyberbullying. But I do think mm-hmm. this is just this awful situation of this girl killing herself. And um, I was watching Megan Meyer's mother do um, a television spot this morning and just think, and she was of course defending the verdict because it makes her feel vindicated and she feels like this is justice. Um, And I was struck by the sort of very unprofound, you know, basic observation that there are just some terrible things in the world for which there is no clear culpability. And it's really hard to know how, you know, I don't think Lori Drew is completely not responsible for this death. On the other hand, the idea of holding her criminally liable seems wrong. Well, could we talk more generally about suicide and who's responsible for suicide generally? I mean, do we have clear ideas as a society what we think when someone commits suicide? I mean, usually the other members of the family feel tremendously guilty. It's a very hostile uh, thing to do, not just to yourself, to murder yourself, but to leave everyone who knew you uh, to go over what they had done and how they might have caused it. And one of the things that troubles me about the Lori Drew case is that she's a scapegoat, that everybody who knew Megan Meyer and anyone who knows someone, especially a child who kills herself, uh, has reason to feel very guilty. I mean, the mother let the daughter use the computer, and, and, you know, there are other responsibilities. Uh, How how did this daughter come to have a mental condition where if a a stranger that uh, she fell in love with online broke up with her, that she would be motivated to commit suicide? I mean, that's you know, there's more causation than just the last straw. A lot of people are responsible. Do we really want to make that criminal responsibility? Or even just at the level of uh, moral responsibility, uh, what do we really think about suicide? I mean, have you known anyone who's committed suicide, and did you feel responsible? Um, I mean, some of this is that Megan Meyer's mother has a motivation to make everybody say, hey, look, it's Lori Drew who's responsible for everything, because she has her own problem with feeling guilty. Right. I mean, I think to the extent that this case sends the message that you can point a figure, a finger in some easy, simplistic way at someone else for a suicide, then that's, you know, that's a disservice and, and really not useful. The one sort of defense of the prosecution I would give is, is really only to talk about it in terms of a form of rough justice, which is that because, in the end, the jury only convicted Drew on these three misdemeanor charges, she's likely to get a quite light sentence, perhaps even probation. And so, setting aside just for a second all these problematic issues we've raised about the precedent this raises, in this mm-hmm. particular case, the idea that this woman, for this um, for this act of cyberbullying, might you know have to go do community service or pay a fine, that outcome doesn't seem like a travesty of justice to me, even if the way that we got there... Um, is not worth it at all and, and not how we should have gotten there. I, I guess if I'm just, I, I'm simply saying that um, from the point of view of the jury, I can imagine having heard the evidence in this case and have felt like some sense that in some rough way that Lori Drew had some responsibility, um, even if it wasn't primary, and that, you know, holding her to account on some level was, um, was what the jury was doing. So, in other words, but but are you celebrating jury misconduct like that? Uh, kind of. I mean, that's saying, the problem with this argument is that it's not actually a very, 
it's it's not a legal argument, right? Because all, if all the I mean, steps jurors <laughs> need to know what their responsibility is and not to do other things. Right, right. I mean, it's one well, thing to have jury nullification. It's quite another to convict someone because you think they're a bad person. Right, except I will... Them. Okay, I'm going to keep going with this a little bit, even though I have a feeling I'm out on the limb. But, but in defense of the jury, this wasn't actually jury nullification. They only held her responsible for exactly what they felt the prosecution had proved, which was that no, indeed... No, no, but, but, but you... you but you were suggesting that you liked something that was the opposite of jury nullification. It's one thing, jury nullification is when you let someone off the hook because you think the law is wrong. Mm -hmm. If they had found her not guilty on everything, that would, would have been true. The forewoman of the jury was saying we actually wanted to convict her on, on everything, but we didn't. they didn't give us the evidence because they didn't give us that last message, the go kill yourself message. Right, right, um, right. And so they weren't nullifying, but you were just suggesting it's a kind of rough justice. We shouldn't feel that bad about it because, after all, she really deserves what she's going to get, whatever this level of sentence is. And so you're suggesting that jurors really can find people guilty on some count just so the person will get some punishment because they think they deserve some punishment, not because they were because the conviction was proved, the elements were proved according to the standard of proof. Yeah. And I think that that's a terrible message to get out there, and it's it's really asking for violations of due process. Right. No, I'm actually, I'm, you're right. I'm not going to go defend that. What no. I meant... <laughs> What I was trying to say was that this, uh, the idea of Lori Drew getting probation or a fine for what she did, I don't find mm -hmm. that outcome to be a terrible outcome in this case. However, um, the idea that that then means that a jury could, you know, go out and just find someone guilty because they want to, you know, they don't like them, that is different and problematic. And and I also think in this case, it's sort of an accident that the outcome wasn't a travesty of justice because right. in the end, if these, if there was proof of these three misdemeanors, and it seems like there was, that still doesn't go address the question of whether this case should have been brought in the first place. And I think that, you know, from the kind of, you know, rule of law standpoint, that's what we're all up in arms about and, you know, why I, yeah. I can't imagine this case is going to stand up on appeal, frankly. I don't know. Would you well, I certainly hope that? it doesn't. You, you know, Warren Kerr, who you mentioned, he really is working on this yeah. case and representing her, so he's not a, a neutral party. So I think she's going to be very well represented. It'll be presented very strongly, especially in terms of the free speech uh, issues. I mean, people need to, people do things online. They play pranks. They impersonate. Uh, they go over the top a lot, and it's an important aspect of free speech that people be able to do that. I mean, I have a problem with some of these other cases about uh, cyberbullying, e even the cases where they're just uh, civil cases, torts cases. But uh, the idea that we're going to upgrade all this into cyberbullying, um, it's just uh, too repressive and too uh, s susceptible to uh, all kinds of government abuse. I don't know why people aren't more afraid. People just don't think to be, seem to think very sharply. Even intelligent people that I see writing online don't seem to think very sharply about uh, legal issues and the idea that, well, they just hate this woman, so she's getting what's coming to her, and they don't see that they're setting rules that apply across a variety of cases, and they don't see that the uh, crimes have to be defined in statutes and the jurors need to follow instructions. When did people lose track of all those very basic things? Well, this is always hard about defending the civil libertarian point of view, is that you're sort of trying to rouse people from their general slumber and prove to them that there's some personal risk, which I think can sometimes seem attenuated, even when really it's not. Um, yeah, I mean, imagine someone killing themselves after something you did. I mean, once the person is dead, it seems outrageous, but you didn't intend to kill them. Um, you know, there's a lot of guilt, the idea that th that, that uh, requires criminal sentences. I mean, I, I just think people have sort of well, have taken leave of their sen senses because they just hate Laurie Drew so much. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I know I see all of that. I also do think, and this is a separate question because you're talking about criminal liability, but... I mean, this was the facts of this case from the point of view of a parent, you know, all these sort of things that we grapple with about letting our kids online and how we control that. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just like such a cautionary tale and incredibly upsetting. And so, you know, forget about yeah. the government for a minute because that's an incredibly heavy-handed way to try and, um, you know, have an effect on kids' behavior. But I do think that for parents um, and, and maybe schools and other institutions that deal with kids, there are some lessons to be learned here. It, it seems to me that the best lesson is not to go running to the government to get vengeance for you, but if you're going to before you let your child go online, make sure they understand how things work, that there's an abusive environment, that people play tricks, 
that people are not always what they seem to be. Some people can be very dangerous or they can, you know, you can also just get your feelings hurt. And if you're not ready to handle that, you can't be online. You know, uh, don't let them be in their room alone with the computer. Right. And uh, make sure that, especially if you know you have a child that is over-emotional or suffers from depression or has any kind of a pro or, or a tendency to uh, get into all kinds of trouble, uh, you know, you need to protect that child and make sure that they have the wherewithal to go online or don't let them go online. Right. Just to remember, somebody might be hoaxing you. Somebody, you know, you got to, if you're going to be competent in this world, just like you need to learn how to watch commercials without believing everything, you need to know how to deal with things that may not be what they seem. Right. To be competent. So teach kids that or don't let them online until they're ready to deal with that. And I think also there's this question about what's appropriate at what age. I mean, Megan Meyer was 13. That's actually pretty young to have completely unfettered access to a computer. Um, you have to remember that even if a child seems like they're safe in your house, that the computer is a portal onto the entire world and everything in it. And um, Yeah. And, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so we had a couple of, uh, we had a couple other uh, issues we wanted to get to. So let me drag in. The second issue was uh, there was a, a, a speaking of children, there was a school in Claremont, California where they had a long uh, tradition of these two schools would uh, one would dress up as uh, kids in one school would dress up as pilgrims and in another school would dress up as Indians and then they would come and meet each other and celebrate uh, Thanksgiving. And then there's some question about whether it's offensive to Native Americans because the children were making their own costumes. So, of course, the Indian costume was a complete stereotype of, you know, fringe and, uh, you know, a headband with a feather. And, uh, and uh, so there were objections whether the school ought to, uh, ought to uh, get rid of that practice. Did you have a, some thoughts on that? You know, this is a hard one for me. I mean... On the one hand, I mean, the idea that, you know, you're going, again, like, it's a very heavy-handed measure to call for, you know, preventing children from dressing up in a particular way that I think for most Americans seems kind of innocent. On the other hand, mm -hmm. um, the mother who objected in this case, um, who I think had her own mother was a Seneca Indian, said that she felt mm -hmm. like her child was being exposed to or was being asked to perpetuate these racist stereotypes. And it, it did make me think for a minute about, you know, how we portray Native Americans in this culture, I feel like we are still at this very in-between moment. You know, we still have a football team called mm -hmm. the Redskins. Like, we still, we, we are trafficking in essentially, like, a very one-dimensional portrayal of people. Um, and we've gotten very yeah. sensitized to portrayals of certain other groups. I mean, you think about the way African Americans are portrayed. We've, you know, gotten away from doing anything in blackface. Like, those lines are much clearer. Mm -hmm. Um the mother tried to draw an analogy. She said something like, you know, you wouldn't have the kids dressing up as slaves and slim, friendly slave masters, and you wouldn't have them dressing up as Jews and friendly Nazis. I don't think the parallel is quite right, but I'm having trouble putting my hand, finger on exactly where I Well, think. because the pilgrims and the Indians were having a, a festive, positive occasion. Yes, right. right. Thanksgiving and, right. Is, a, is not a, a war. Right, and one thing I wonder about is if we you know, we decide that we can't have kids dressing up as Indians anymore, then does that mean we just denude the culture of images of Native Americans? I mean, I was thinking about, I don't know if you remember this, but in the movie Peter Pan, there's like this pretty long sequence of them, of the kids, you know, Wendy and Peter going into this camp of Indians, yeah. and it's, it's yeah, it's like total stereotype land that, you know, the Indians are going, oh, oh, and... And yeah. it's all presented kind of humorously. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure I, I would advocate for everyone to stop watching that movie exactly. I, I don't know. What do well, you think? Well, kids, uh, we used to play cowboys and Indians, right? And now it would probably be, well, that's offensive. That's like using a race. We, we don't play slaves and slave owners. Or if you discovered your kids playing slaves and slave owners, would you have to stop them or... Would you just uh, hope nobody <laughs> saw them, or what would you do? Right, and I guess the other thing that's hard is, you know, Indians... The images of Indians and in headdresses and their native dress, like those are very beautiful, iconic, kind of fascinating images for kids. I think a lot of kids get excited about that, and it can be like a very mm -hmm. glorious portrayal of Native Americans, too. So, how do you decide that, you know, one child's Indian headdress is celebratory and another one's is a racist stereotype? Um, you know, in well, the story. Maybe they. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that I in the story you pointed to on your blog about Claremont, there was a different parent who, you know, I think had, had a Cherokee background, if I'm remembering correctly, uh -huh. who said, wait, like, my kid really likes to put on his headdress. Like, I don't want to take that opportunity yeah. away from him. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, you know, 
there are different issues about uh, do you think there should actually be lawsuits and legal remedies for this, and, and I tend to oppose them, but the idea, I'm, I, I tend to be sort of uh, uh, tolerant and forgiving of the teachers who try to do these kind of uh, play acting or hands-on kinds of activities, and they often involve multicultural lessons, and often I think the judgment is bad. But I, I, I don't like to see the, the, uh, any kind of legal remedy against them, but I do think that the teachers ought to rethink what they're doing and that there's a lot of bad judgment there. I think often they think they're bringing multicultural lessons uh, to the children, but then they may require them to act out, uh, do hands-on kinds of things that, uh, that, that can be... Uh, well, some of them are religious, so I actually have a special problem with the religious things. And with respect to some groups, they treat them as if they're sort of colorful, charming, diversity-enhancing exercises, and then other groups won't be treated that way. So, for example, things having to do with Indian religion are often uh, used in classrooms as if it's not really real religion. Mm -hmm. It's sort of just like a kind of colorful theater. Yeah, and um, I I think that there there is a danger that some groups are going to be regarded, that that there's an inequality in that, that that there's some groups that seem to be there for our amusement or for, uh, for color and diversity, and, then, uh, and, and there is something demeaning about that. So I think it, it may not make a good um, exercise for, for the teacher to do. Although if the kids are making their own costumes, um, you know, maybe, that, uh, maybe that is different. Maybe, maybe uh, it should just be more historically accurate, and, and, the, in, and the Indian costumes ought to represent the actual Indian tribe that was involved in the first Thanksgiving rather than just the stereotype of some Plains Indian or whatever people use. Or maybe Thanksgiving isn't actually the minute, the moment, I know it's the traditional moment for kids to dress like Indians, but maybe actually what you want is a separate day where you can celebrate Native American culture in a more historically accurate way that doesn't get, it, it, you know, once you have the Indians and the pilgrims, you beg the question of what the relationship between them was, and of course, like, mm-hmm. you know, most of the legacy of colonial Americans toward Native Americans is about poisoning them with, you know, smallpox by accident and killing them. And so to, I, I can see the perspective of the mother who felt that glossing over all of that history was deeply unsettling. Yeah. Um, so maybe yeah. you separate the two in the context yeah. of little kids where you're really not going to explain all of the historical accuracy yeah. maybe that's one solution you don't want to I mean the really horrible uh, violent brutalities that have occurred are not really appropriate for kindergarten and first grade right but I think that there's a, you know there's a desire to introduce uh, children to uh, the practices of different cultures and and to teach uh, about the, the diversity yeah. of religions and so forth and, uh, and but there are a lot of mistakes that can be made along the way such as I mean there are some cases I blogged about one a couple of years ago where uh, they wanted to teach the uh, kids about uh, Muslims, so they actually had them play act that they were Muslims for a week, adopting names and um, you know fast giving up some food so that it would be like Ramadan. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was actually putting. And some parents objected and sued. The parents lost uh, in the Ninth Circuit, but um, I think that there's some real problems with overstepping the lines there and making uh, kids act out uh, things where the teachers mean well. But they're not really doing the right thing. Right, it's sort of the uh, the message is very garbled by the end of it. Yeah, you know they like these uh, play acting and hands on kind of activities. Maybe we should go back to just teaching uh, kids from uh, books and not make them play act. That sounds very traditional. I don't know. <laughs> My kids, you know, they've been putting down school. book learning <laughs> for a long time. Well, I mean, what's what's wrong with good old fashioned book learning? Maybe we should go back to that and we get into less trouble. Maybe, although I don't know if it's a total either or, right? You could imagine <laughs> for both. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking of uh, activities and prayer-like uh, exercises, we wanted to talk a little about the Pledge of Allegiance because the Reverend George M. Doherty died on Thanksgiving at the age of 97. And he was the person who got started the effort that ended uh, with uh, Congress adding the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, which has been a legal issue in in recent years. So I thought it was interesting to see this person and how he got uh, started uh, uh, with the idea. He had uh, uh, the... took the phrase out of the Gettysburg Address, you know, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. So he thought that belonged in the pledge, and he was upset to see his... uh, son doing the pledge that he said um, 
uh, was something that could, could have been uh, recited in the Soviet Union. He said, I could hear little Muscovites recite a similar pledge to their hammer and sickle flag with equal solemnity. Excellent so there was phrase an, there. <laughs> yeah, he had a way with words. Yeah, he actually was a very prominent minister who did a lot of other uh, good things having to do with the uh, civil rights and so on. So he wasn't really about ramming a lot of religion into the schools, but he did think that there was a... Uh, he, he, he did harken back to Lincoln and this idea of including God in the um, public exercise uh, of reciting the pledge. Um, and I wonder if you have any, any thoughts about that, whether... Um, well, it's two little words. We could actually... Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say these two words, I'm sure, cause a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, a few years ago we saw this issue go up to the Supreme Court and then kind right. of disappear. Um, the court dismissed the case on other grounds, didn't have to reach this yep. constitutional question, which I thought was They awfully, went out of their way to get rid of it. Yeah, it was awfully convenient, certainly. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm really curious to hear what you think about this. My own take, I'm, I'm not a purist on First Amendment grounds, in part because... There's, it seems to me like historically the framers, um, you know, and they never really had the notion of completely banishing religious religion from the public sphere. I mean, there were invocations right. being given in the early meetings of Congress. There, the, the dollar bill has, I think, always had "In God We Trust" on it, um, mm -hmm. and yet there, it's I the do, motto. yeah, right. I mean, and yet I do think there is an inconsistency between those assumptions that, of course, religion in belief in God is part of um, American culture and the notion of separating out religion. And I understand why atheists find this dismaying. And then I think in the, in yeah. the instance of the pledge, you have a, a particularly problematic uh, illustration of this because this is something children are required to say in school. Every day. Every day. And they're required to go to school. So you have compulsory schooling. You're not compelled to take public schooling, but it can be hard to get out of public schooling. Right. Um, and uh, so you, you're compelled to go to school, and then you have to... And then this goes on every day. You don't, you're not required to say it. You have a legal right not to say it. Right. But then you and have to single you yourself say out. it and... Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, you don't want to look like the outsider. So, and and you know, there's a kind of speaking of children again. If you're young, and, and the Supreme Court has recognized that there's more coercion. The idea, if everybody else is doing it, you even if you have a right not to do it, you'll feel like compelled or coerced to do it. Uh, so it's very hard not to do it. And uh, yeah, having to say under God, if you don't believe in God, or if you haven't figured out whether you believe in God yet, and, and children don't really have an idea that they've got a choice at that point, um, it's, it's troublesome for a child. And yet, at this point, to take it out is a huge problem. But I'm interested in this moment when they put it in and why they put it in, that it had to do with um, you know, distinguishing us from the godless um, communists. Exactly. It's part of the, you know, 50s move to, to really wall off Russia as this alien part of the world that we wanted to disassociate ourselves from. Mm -hmm. I have to say, mm -hmm. there's just part of me, you know, it's kind of rare for people to say, like, oh, something's missing from this pledge. Like, it's incomplete. Yeah. We need, it's, <laughs> I sort of wish he just never had the idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, maybe what's wrong with it is that we shouldn't be pledging allegiance to a flag and a government and that people really do have higher beliefs, beliefs in God, beliefs that there are things that they owe more allegiance to than the country. And uh, they just shouldn't be put into the conflict of having to publicly make, uh, uh, profess their allegiance to, to the country. Yeah, um, it's kind of an odd string of words when you start unpacking it, it the whole notion. And the, and the kids don't understand what they're saying, too. And so I have a big problem with, uh, I mean, there, this is all on this theme of child abuse, you know, making children say things that they, they don't believe, they don't even understand what they're saying. I mean, if you, if you question the kids that say the Pledge of Allegiance about what they just said, they don't understand what they're saying. The they don't know hand, what they mean. Oh, I agree with you about that. On the other hand, though, I wonder, even if they don't understand the words, if they kind of assimilate some vague notion of patriotism or just connection to, you know, America, the flag, the government. I'm not yeah. sure. I did, I went to Quaker school growing up, and um, Quakers oh. are, don't, are not into vows and oaths, and we never said the pledge. Mm -hmm. um, I, mm -hmm. I, I, who knows what impact that really has, but I, I wonder if, um, you know, when I look at my own kids, like, if it would be different or not different from them if they say it. Um, or not say it. My children tend so to encounter the Pledge of Allegiance at camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So, and that's private. That's not the government. Right, right. right. So, so it doesn't raise the same kind of compulsory issues. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not sure about all of that. Whether it is, I, I, feel, I guess what I'm saying is that even if kids don't understand the words, I don't think the act of reciting the pledge is necessarily a meaningless act for them. So you were saying you actually like the idea, and obviously when we, people instill religion in children, they're doing a similar thing. The child can't really understand that, but that's what's so good about getting your uh, getting to them at that age where you can instill these sort of deep uh, chords of feeling, and uh, and they don't need to understand it, and they shouldn't be asked to judge it. We should just be instilling patriotism and love for country through this exercise that is something that's sort of beyond them, but they're still included in it. Um, question whether that's a good thing, and it is the same methodology that's used to instill religion in students. You know, I had a discussion in my religion and the Constitution class the other day with a, st- a lot of students uh, seemed to object to the idea that parents are allowed to inculcate religion in their children, that there's something wrong with doing that, and I know Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins or one of those people, or maybe <laughs> both say in their books, their <laughs> atheism books, that it's child abuse to instill religion in children. Yeah, you know, you're making them believe something. They're not able to judge it. They're just accepting it. Uh, you know, you're you're defrauding them. You're and that should count as abuse. And you know th- that uh, you can't have a religion until you're old enough to judge it. So, but but maybe you approve of the uh, of getting to the children when they're young and creating uh, deep uh, feelings that aren't really about reasoning. Well, I guess I mean I think it's really different to talk about parents inculcating religion versus the state inculcating patriotism um, wedded to yeah, religion, really. which is sort of what you have going on with the pledge. Like, those are really different things to me. I don't have a problem with parents inculcating religion. I don't think that children need to be entirely free agents in the world. Um, the patriotism question, I'm not sure what I think. I'm sort of playing with it. I mean, I think, you know, it's funny. This is a moment where I think a lot of liberals, because they're excited about the election of Barack Obama, are are trying to embrace the flag and embrace traditional patriotism more right. than some people have in the past. Um I grew up with a fair amount of discomfort about the the very obvious use of those symbols. But then sometimes I think, yeah. well, why not try and take them back? Um, or why not try and feel like oh, I own them too? Um, you know, there isn't anything yeah. inherently... Yeah, good point. I mean, the American flag is a symbol of our country. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is bad when certain pe- people at some place or the other on the political spectrum decide that patriotism patriotism is just bad and uh, and respect for the flag is associated with the other side and and I think most mainstream uh, Democrats and opponents of the war don't want to be typecast that way that opposition to some particular policy doesn't mean that you're not patriotic um, so I mean you could have this just very generic kind of well it's a very generic kind of respect for the country patriotism to have the flag salute I mean the flag is a symbol, but, you know, what does it mean? It means what it means to you. But by the same token, under God, uh, you know, God is a very generic concept. It does exclude complete athe- atheism, uh, but it's a pretty abstract and uh, sort of ceremonial use of, uh, of the deity, so uh, perhaps it isn't so wrong. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think that's basically where I come down to, although I feel like we should end this with some note of vehement disagreement. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. What can we disagree on? Um, hmm. It's okay. We did a good job. Uh, there have been other... <laughs> I think we have a little disagreement in there. I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. It's been a pleasure so wait, oh, talking let's just with say, you, Anne. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, are we done? I, I think we can. Do you want to sort of wrap... Do you want... Should we do like an official goodbye? Or I don't know how you usually end. Well, yeah. I, I just wasn't sure you were actually hitting the button on me and I wanted to simultaneously hit oh, the yeah, button. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't so. hit the button. I didn't hit the button. I, I, I just... like the... Uh, I like the symmetry of the ending. So. <laughs> All right. Well, um, it was great talking to you, and uh, I hope we cleared a few things up for people. Yes, so. I hope so, too, and it was really <laughs> fun. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.